Good morning, class. Today's lecture is on joints. Of course, a great interest to those of you interested in um, human movement and athletic training. Uh, yes, we talked about already the uh, temporomandibular joint. So it allows you to go. Has this complex movement, doesn't it? We talked about TMJ, if you grind your teeth, it can cause issues. Now we'll move on to the joints in our body that allow us to move. And uh, first will be an overview, kind of categorize joints into different groups. And then uh, we'll get to the shoulder, elbow, hip, and knee. We'll do those. So we don't go through all your ankle, your finger, all the joints, but we'll do uh, some of the biggies. All right, let's do it. Here we go. <clears throat> so I got some video on here, makes the PowerPoint huge, but just really shows that movement. So looking at this, let's see what you guys know. You, uh, you know the different bones, their names and all. So you see the metacarpals, right? One through five. Yeah. You even see, I don't know if I'll be able to, um, no, to draw in here. Don't do that. All right. I can draw right on the movie. Um, I'm seeing there at the tip of the, uh, um, the first metacarpal, it looks like some a sesamoid bone. See the little kind of P-shaped bone there? And you'll see that under your big toe. So sesamoid bones form in tendons to allow them to move nicely. And then, you know, taking a look at uh, this joint here. So you know these are your phalanges, your fingers, and then your metacarpals make up your palm. And so this joint, your metacarpal phalangeal joint, what is allowed there? What kind of movements? And you're allowed this hinge type of movement, right? But also, yeah, you can move them side to side. What about your interphalangeal joints? What about between your fingers? where you can flex and extend a hinge joint. Can you move them side to side? No. And then uh, you look at your thumb. It has a little more, uh, has some a little more movement than these, these other metacarpals, doesn't it? Well, the reason for this is because if you look at the anatomy of the joints, the joints are constructed in a way to allow movement in certain directions and prevent in other directions. So although my metacarpal phalanges, I can bend them this way, move them this way, I can't rotate them a little bit if you force it, but there's no rotation there. Yeah, and that's because of the arrangement of the bones is in the joint is such that <clears throat> movement is only allowed in certain directions. And all of your joints are, are strengthened by ligaments that surround it in a joint capsule that are preventing movement. Imagine your knee, you, you don't want it moving side to side, you want it just to, to hinge, right? <clears throat> so on the sides, you have some tough ligaments that are preventing that movement. And where you want it to move, the capsule is thinner so that the, it can easily uh, be flexible there. All right, just kind of a big overview there. So where bones come together, they articulate. So I can buy a disarticulated skeleton, all the bones are in a pile, or like in lab, the skeletons that are hanging are articulated human skeletons. So articulating, the bones coming together. And um, what some of the joints, even those, um, Epiphyseal plates, that cartilage that allows uh, bones to grow longer, that's technically a joint. Uh, it's going to fuse at a certain point, it turns into bone, but that cartilage between those bones, we're going to throw in here. The sutures that hold your skull bones together also are joints, even though they don't move. So wherever bones come together, technically it will be a joint, although it's a big difference between your knee and where your parietal bones come together, right? And even uh, when you look at um, the uh, fontanelles, the soft spots in a baby's skull, um, uh, those are, are joints that will turn into those sutures in the skull, uh, definitely. And of course, joints allow our movement to take place. And, and each of our joints have a certain amount of movement. Your shoulder has a great range of movement, ROM, range of movement, a tremendous range of movement. Whereas metaphalangeal joints can only bend in one direction normally. So we're gonna classify joints quickly, uh, two different ways. You can do it by the amount of movement, and then you can do it by the anatomy of the joint. So we'll give you both and 
you know, there'll be multiple choice question on this course. Uh, first of all, terminology. When muscles uh, attach to bones, it's a tendon. Uh, ligaments are, they're made of the same dense, regular connective tissue, just tough collagen fibers, some elastic fibers in there. Not many cells, avascular, so it doesn't heal very well at all, ligaments or tendons. And then, of course, cartilage is what you find at the ends of all your bones that'll be in those joints. So it'd be hyaline cartilage. We'll talk about some fibrocartilage, too, being in the meniscus of the knee or between the intervertebral discs when you need it super strong. And that cartilage is slippery. We'll see, you have a little bit of fluid, this synovial fluid that, uh, that keeps everything lubricated. So joints can be immovable. <clears throat> These are joints in your skull. Talk about, well, it'll be synarthrotic. We'll talk about with it. Uh, anything arthro is joint. So arthropods are your insects and crustaceans because their their legs are jointed, right? Arthroscopic surgery, right? Arthritis, arthro is joint. So um, immovable, such as the bones of your skull. Slightly movable, your intervertebral, intervertebral discs, they can bend, but not very much. Finally, highly movable, the synovial joints in your knee and shoulder and elbow, these move quite a bit. So no movement, a little bit of movement, and then freely movable. So the immovable joints are where bones are pretty much fused together, but there is just a little bit of um, uh, collagen connective tissue between the bones. Even the suture in your skull has uh, the bones come together, but if you look microscopically, there's fibers that are, are sewing those bones together. And your pelvis bones, of course, too, ilium, ischium, pubis, they are completely fused together. There's no movement between those once you uh, have them fused. So slightly movable, we're talking about here. And in your intervertebral discs, um, each one is slightly movable, but you add the dozens of vertebrae, and then you can do quite a bit of bending of the spine. So each individual one bends a little, but since you have a whole row of them, you can do uh, lots of movements of your spine. And they've got that, uh, those discs, you know, the fibrocartilage, right? A little gooey center. And when we look at our vertebrae, you've got tough ligaments that prevent over movement. So you want you to be able to flex and extend, laterally bend your, your vertebrae, but not too much. So there's really tough ligaments that um, tighten as you keep bending. But most joints, we're talking about synovial joints. These are the uh, joints that ha have a lot of movement in them. And uh, again, that fluid is just a little bit. Your knee has like half a milliliter. It's a very little bit normally, but it can blow up, right? If it's too much fluid. And it uh, allows a little bit of movement. The hyaline cartilage is slippery when it has that wet fluid on it. Uh, it's going to be in this, this capsule that holds the fluid. And then ligaments and muscles will strengthen that, that joint around it. So looking at, first of all, functional, these terms, remember arthritis, ar arthro is, means joint. So synarthrotic, like synergy together, means that they're, they're together and uh, these joints don't move. Amphi, like amphibian, goes water, it goes to both. A little bit of movement, like your vertebrae. And then when you hear diarthritic, oh, that's lots of movement. It can go either way. And now we're talking about structurally. We we'll talk about um, fibrous ones. The bones are just, you know, tightly together. Um, yeah. And then cartilaginous joints will have a little bit of cartilage between them, like those intervertebral discs. And then again, synovial joints, we'll spend most of this lecture talking about those. So fibrous joints, where you don't have much movement. Um, we'll see, uh, uh, syndesmosis is the first one we'll talk about. Um, and then sutures are found between your skull bones. And then a gumphopus is your tooth socket. It's a fancy word for that. So syndesmosis, we're talking about like the, the, uh, between your radius and ulna. If you looked in there, the bones, there's gonna be a sheet of connective tissue. It's really tough membrane between those two. And it separates your muscles into flexors and extensors in your forearm and in your, in your uh, calf as well. But it's called the interosseous membrane. It means between bone membrane, right? Interosseous membrane. And uh, it allows, uh, you know, so you can pronate and supinate, you can move 
but it's a nice wall barrier that keeps those bones together. <clears throat> so a little bit of movement, but uh, it's tightly, those bones are not gonna fall apart. Beautiful suture, oh my gosh. And remember, you don't start out this way. You start out with big soft spots. Your parietal bones and your frontal bone are just these islands of bone that are separated by, by a membrane. And then as you get older, finally after two years old, the bones are sutured together as your skull has had time to grow. And this kind of, look how complex that is. It's like they're sewn together. And so you imagine your skull is hit. It's not gonna break easily. Like if they were just lined up, you know, a strong blow could, could easily move these. But since they're sewn together, usually the bone breaks. You don't, it doesn't break at that suture. So sutures like sewing them together gives you a really tight connection. Yep. And in life, there's a little collagen between those. The bones are not actually completely fused together. Gomphophis, uh, your teeth move. They do when you chew on granola or something hard. They, there's movement and the nerves will let your brain know where the, where the food is in your mouth. So your, your teeth are not cemented to the bone. But there's a periodontal ligament. There's collagen fibers that tether the tooth tightly in the socket. So there's not a lot of movement, right? Cartilaginous, it's hard to say, cartilaginous joints. Um, the symphysis, we'll talk about that where your pubic bones come together. Uh, and then synchondrosis. Anything chondro is cartilage, so syn has come together. And uh, one of them is these epiphyseal plates, which it doesn't seem like a joint. It just seems like a cartilage that grows as your bone grows. But we'll call that a joint. It's cartilage between two bones. And that was temporary. It will ossify, and in me, they're gone. It's just a thin line, if you look carefully at, at, the, at my bones. <clears throat> the first rib is a uh, synchondrosis. It is cartilage just fuses that. Um, the other ribs are, um, usually synovial joints, there's more movement. But that first rib is just like kind of cemented on there through the cartilage. And then a synthesis uh, is a pad of fiber cartilage uh, between two bones. And the only two places we're really talking about here is this, uh, remember this, the, the uh, pelvis in the lab? The two pubic bones came together, there was a bit of plastic between them, a rubber. And that's that uh, pubic synthesis. And during childbirth, there's a hormone that comes out and it's gonna relax that uh, cartilage and even the cartilage in the coccyx to make it bend back a little bit, little more room just for childbirth in that, uh, the outlet of the pelvis. Yep. And then the intervertebral discs. Once again, know that it's made out of a ring of fibrocartilage. And on the inside, there's a little gelatinous core. And with time, those uh, discs dehydrate and that gel can come out and you can have a herniated disc. All right, and we're to the synovial joints and that's what we'll I'll spend the rest of the time talking about. Um, the ov, like egg, ova, your ovum, egg, has to do with the, the synovial fluid, feels like egg whites. So it's slippery, kind of gooey, and uh, this membrane inside secretes it. And that fluid also washes over the cartilage. And if you remember that articular cartilage, there's no blood vessels in it. So it helps deliver some nutrients to the cartilage too. Um, you can sample this fluid in the joint. And if there's blood or pus, there's obviously an issue. Um, you can uh, culture the bacteria. It can be Lyme disease or streptococcus, staphylococcus, gonorrhea even, can infect the joints. And if you know what it is, then you can give the right antibiotics. So, um, they can do uh, uh, um, uh, arthroscopic surgery, make just small slit, and you can take or needle and get get samples of that fluid. There should only be a little bit of it. And um, yeah, when you look at the whole joints, let's see, take a look here. You can look at it like this. What you're going to have is bone. There's two bones, and at the ends of the bones is going to be this cartilage. And this space has been exaggerated. They're actually touching, but I just pulled it apart for this, for this drawing. And then articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage, and it's nice and healthy. It's a thick cushioning layer. It's slippery because of that fluid in there. Beautiful. And then what you have is a, a joint capsule, and it really goes all the way around it. 
it you know, completely surrounds it. Um, and in, if you look at a phalange, what happens is the front and the back are pretty thin, but then the outsides are strengthened by these ligaments so that it doesn't permit sideways movement, only this way. So same thing with the knee. It's thin in the front and the back, so you can bend it. And it's thick on the sides because you don't want any of that kind of movement. And then lining the inside, let's see, how about green? Then lining the inside of this tough fibrous part of the capsule, that completely every, everywhere, and it stops at the articular cartilage though. So it doesn't go over the articular cartilage, is this synovial membrane that's secreting the fluid, the synovial fluid in there. So that's your basic, your basic joint. You've got a synovial cavity in the inside, just a small space, and that membrane surrounds it. Sometimes it's even has uh, uh, indentations to increase surface area to make more fluid. There's often fat pads inside some of these joints too to fill in the spaces and uh, allow it to be cushioning. And then the whole joint has a capsule around it. And so it's really tough, lots of collagen. And then the inside is the fluid producing membrane. Yep, it goes everywhere on the bone but not on the articular cartilage, that's naked. So it's just cartilage on cartilage. So that's your basic synovial joint of all the joints that we're, uh, we're looking at. Joint cavity, joint capsule, synovial membrane with the fluid. And then we'll talk about the knee meniscus. There'll be these fiber cartilage pads. All right, bursa, you've heard of bursitis. Uh, uh, a bursa is just one of these, like a, like a synovial joint without the joint. It's just going to be, ah, I guess I need my other color. Here's the tough outer part of it. And the green in there is, of course, secreting, uh, secreting the fluid. So imagine it's a, like a plastic bag or a balloon, a balloon, a little bit of oil in it. So it kind of moves around, it's kind of slippery. And uh, you find bursa around the joints, especially in the shoulder and the knee. You find it under the skin too, so that there's movement around. Oh, we're, we're on the outside of bones. There's quite a bit of ischial tuberosity. And uh, yeah, looking at the knee, look at all the bursa. There's a prepatellar, infrapatellar, uh, 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 all around underneath where, the, where, where, where ligaments are, bursa. So bursa allow some, some movement. You can have bursa forming abnormally too. People that carry a big stick holding water or bananas or something on their shoulders constantly can develop bursa other places. Um, and they can become inflamed, of course, bursa. You need to, maybe you got bursitis in the shoulder and there's, you might have to drain fluid or give uh, <clears throat> steroids. Oh yeah, I'm showing you large bursa, right? That they gotta do something about. All right, look at the types of joints. Synovial joints has to do with the movement there. And you can look at these in your book, but I'll just, just go through them here. Ball and socket has a big spherical head. And you know, look at your shoulder. You've got, uh, um, you've got uh, uh, abduction and adduction. You've got uh, flexion and extension. You've got medial rotation, lateral rotation, circumduction when it goes all over the place. So. Uh, ball and socket allows movement and rotation everywhere. Now, when you get a condylar ellipsoid, uh, instead of being a sphere, it's uh, like this. Yeah, um, kind of looks like the mandibular condyle here. Um, um, and what you see here is uh, um, uh, the ability to move this way and sideways. See, there's some movement, but it can't really rotate because of the shape of this. It doesn't want to like, you'd have to lift it up to rotate it. So it limits movement in some directions. A plane or gliding joint um, can move and rotate. It's just kind of a flat joint like that. Hinge is obviously a hinge. It only moves one direction or your, your elbow. A pivot joint moves around a central pivot, like your atlas and axis. And your thumb has a saddle joint. So look at the, the anatomy of that. You can see how it allows cool different movements here but it doesn't allow it to rotate because you know it would have to kind of kind of jump there too all right and we talk about movements when we study muscles 
very common to learn origin insertion, right? The origin's kind of the immovable part. So my biceps originates here, maybe it inserts on my radius, because that's the part that moves. So you can do look at that mostly, but you run into issues, you really do, because origin insertion, sometimes both ends can move. Um, look at your abs, right? You could do crunches, but then you can do, you can lift your hip up too. So does it originate on a, up here or down here? Depends because it shortens and both ends can move. Or your pec major, you think you got this. Normally, it originates your pecs on your uh, sternum and on your clavicle and inserts on your humerus. So you can you know, do bench press, right? But there's some cases where if you're breathing really heavily, you can hold on to a table. <gasps> and actually, in that case, it's going to be solid on your humerus. It's going to be a pull up on your chest. So you just reverse what part is moving. Doing a bench press, it's your humerus that's moving. If you're holding your humerus steady, all of a sudden it's your chest. It's going to help you move your chest up. So it's not always straightforward. And I can look here at your chewing muscles and uh, both temporalis and uh, masseter cause you to bite. But look at the direction of those muscles too. Temporalis is also going to retract your jaw. And masseter is going to protract or move your jaw out, isn't it? So. Yeah, anyway, just, uh, we'll get to muscles, we'll get to those soon. But uh, once you learn the bones, then if, you, if I give you some muscles, and you know the joint, and you just realize the muscle's gonna shorten, what's gonna happen to that joint? Uh, just make sure you know your movements. Abduction is a way, like you ab alien abduction or abduct, abduct a child. Yeah, ab, sometimes just people do AB, because it sounds like adduction. So adding is adding together. So this is abducting, adducting, all right? This is abducting my arms, adducting, adding to my body or abducting, moving away. Um, your foot is, uh, when you move your foot off the gas, it's dorsiflexion. When you put foot on the gas, it's plantar flexion. The bottom of your foot, you plant your foot. The bottom is plant. And of course, flexion is going to decrease the angle of a joint. Extension is going to increase the angle. And then hyperextension is when you extend beyond. It can be an injury, or sometimes they talk about um, like hyperextending, just moving my neck beyond the normal position. Uh, rotation, uh, you move your foot out, move your foot in. We talk about that being an outward or lateral rotation or medial rotation. Shoulder too. Circumduction, be able to move in a circle. And of course, the special one, supination, pronation. Like I want a bowl of soup. And your foot can do that. We talk about that, turning inward or outward. Yeah. And supine is laying on your back and prone is laying on your belly. So supination, hands up or body up. That helps you remember. Your foot, we talk about it, you can invert it or evert it. You often, I've sprained my ankle by inverting my foot. And then protraction and retraction, pushing forward, pulling back. And then my scapula, imagine it being elevated or depressed, or my jaw, elevated or depressed. All right, let's talk about some joints. And uh, we're not gonna go in depth in any of them. The knee, the most in depth, we'll do that in lab. But the other ones, we're just gonna give you I'll give you a couple ligaments involved in each, and I think that'll be good. But if you really get into it, oh my God, you know, there's dozens of ligaments in your shoulder and uh, in your ankle, things like that. Shoulder. Shoulder is remarkably movable. The range of motion is just amazing, right? You can get the, something off the top shelf all the way down, right? Forward, backward, rotating. But with that range of motion, comes a cost and the cost is instability and that you can dislocate it because you have that weakness you have a huge head and a little socket so there's lots of movement but it's kind of unstable isn't it so uh, looking at it you know the joint this is the glenoid cavity or fossa of the scapula and here's the head of the humerus big head of the humerus and uh look at the skeleton it's amazing it comes together but in life, you'll see there's a, a lip around it that makes it a little deeper, and you've got ligaments and muscles that are helping stabilize it. Lots of bursae, this uh, 
subdeltoid and super subscapular bursa, lots of bursa around there. And if you're a pitcher or something like that, maybe you know a lot about the bursa because you've had, uh, you've inflamed them. So looking at this picture here, showing it, what you have is the ligament here I want you to know is uh, glenohumeral ligaments. They completely surround it, kind of weak in the bottom, but completely surround it. Glenoid cavity to the humerus, glenohumeral ligaments. And then you kind of remove that and you take a look at this. You can see above it, there's above your shoulder, there's kind of this uh, a bridge above it or a roof that kind of strengthens it above with your acromium here. You got a tough um, uh, coracoacromial ligament stretching between the coracoid process. That provides this nice roof over that um, joint. And so that it, the humerus is not gonna dislocate upward unless you're kind of breaking the acromium or, or breaking that ligament. And then it doesn't show it here, but you've got, here's your biceps tendon. Here's a rotator cuff, rotator cuff. You're gonna have muscles in the back and forward holding it in there. All right, so you look, this is looking into the shoulder and you have, this is gonna be for the hip and the shoulder, it's called the labrum, which means lip. And so it's made out of fiber cartilage. It's a lip that deepens that socket. So that big head of the humerus kind of suctioned in there, helps, help, helps that. You get a torn labrum. Yeah. And then looking at it, you can see these muscles are your rotator cuff muscles, muscles that are surrounding it, that are going to help with movement and stabilizing the shoulder, no matter what position you put your arm in. Yeah, and a good view of this bony roof. But if you look, where is it weakest? It's going to be weakest uh, down here. There's no muscles at the bottom. And you depend on your deltoid and your triceps, all these things to help stabilize it. But the, if the head of that um, humerus is going anywhere, it's going to go down. It's where it's weakest. Um, and that's, that's where dislocations happen. Ah, oh, look at that. Look at the size of the head of the humerus. And that what looks like a small socket. And you're missing, you don't see the labrum there, but it's going to be a little lip that's kind of holding it in there. And then you see the bony roof of the shoulder. Awesome. And this is abducting and adducting your, your humerus. All right, so shoulder joint. If you overuse it, especially uh, looking at thinking about pitchers, uh, you can um, uh, uh, cause damage to bursae, to tendonitis, to uh, labrum tears. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong, of course. All right, your elbow. Fascinating. So obviously it's a hinge. At the same time, you can do this pronation and supination. So your radius can rotate and move around. Your ulna is simply hinging. Now, can you move it side to side? I hope not. Not a lot, right? So nothing is only going to be purely hinge or that rotation. So cool. Yeah. So look at this. Big, the humerus is really big. You've got your uh, forearm muscles attaching to these epicondyles, but you've got this beautiful spot here for the ulna and this round spot for the head of the radius right there. This is a cadaver view looking at the wheel, right? And so you see this here, it's called a trochlea, means a pulley, and this is where the ulna fits in this pulley and just allows it to go to hinge. And then capitulum means head, like decapitate, you know, lose your head. Capitulum is this head, this round head, where that round head of the radius fits in and so it can rotate, pivots around there, yeah. And then this doesn't show it that clearly, but there's a ligament coming off the, uh, the ulna and going around that neck of the radius to keep that radius in so it doesn't come out. And so it allows it to rotate under there. Called the annular ligament. <clears throat> annular, like the annual rings of a tree, means a ring. Yeah, and so looking at it, uh, there's a lot going on, but pretty much what I want you to know is that this joint capsule is thin in the front and in the back so that it can move. But it's thick on the sides, on the two sides, right? And we'll call that simply on the, the outside, the thumb side, the radial collateral ligament. On the inside, we'll call it the ulnar collateral ligament. How's that? And same thing with the knee. We'll talk about a tibia and fibular collateral. So these are on the outsides to prevent this kind of movement. Yeah. So there you go. 
and some of you are uh, double jointed, you know, they can hyperextend it. It has to do with, you know, how lax the, uh, the joint capsule is. So, yeah. But you can see your electron on here is, this thing, is stops in that electron on fossa in the back of the humerus to prevent hyperextension. Beautiful. And you can see the radius there. Yeah. All right, well, um, subluxation is when a uh, joint can come in and out of, uh, um, um, can pop in and out kind of. And so one issue, and I thought kids love this, you know, when you grab them by the arm and swing them around or pull them up by the arm. Turns out it might not be the best idea. Um, so especially what happens in kids, their, their joints are a little um, weaker anyway. And if you can pull a kid by the arm, sometimes that, that you'll have a radial head dis, uh, dislocation. It'll pop out and you got to kind of put it back. And so if you pick up a kid quickly and they, they hold their arm and they're in pain, yeah, you might want to go get an x-ray and you might have to put that back in there. Yeah, this is one of you. Won't name her name, but playing soccer. Uh, horrific looking on the outside. This elbow is clearly something's wrong. Land hard on your elbow. And you can see uh, uh, the, uh, the dislocation where the radius and ulna just came out of where they belong. Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. And uh, they, there's no scar. You just put it back. And... Uh, I dislocated my shoulder and uh, something like this. Once you dislocate it, they can often just put it back, you know. But but then you've weakened the ligaments during this injury, and uh, um, dislocations will tend to happen more, more likely to happen again and again if, if you keep playing the sport or something like that. So once you've weakened it, unless they go in and suture things up, sometimes uh, that injury will repeat. All right, let's talk hip and knee. So your hip joints, tremendous motion, not as much as your shoulder, right? Uh, depending on how flexible you are, you know, like gymnast, you can move your uh, hips more than the eye curve or something like that. But it's a ball and socket, but it's a deeper ball and socket. The acetabulum is deep. Then you add the labrum around, it's really deep. Um, just to let you know, I'll show you a cadaver photo. When we want to just, when we cut a cadaver, we do dissections, we, the shoulder just comes right off. You cut the muscles, it falls off. When we want to take out the hip joint, you've got to cut the muscles. Then you got to move the cadaver to the edge of the uh, uh, bench. And it takes you get a couple of big guys to just force it. Oh, and eventually it will pop out with this audible, will kind of pop out. So it's much tighter. You're much less likely to dislocate your hip. Um, because it's a much tighter thing. Because it's tighter and more stable, you don't have the same range of movement of our, of our shoulder. So you're gonna see everything is a compromise. You can't have optimize everything. So range of motion and stability, you are, are a balance. And uh, in humans, we want more stability in our hips, we want range of motion in our, in, our, in our shoulder. All right, so you guys know, the bones, you know, it's the, the head of the, the femur fits in the acetabulum or socket in the, in the pelvic bone. And the ligaments I want you to know in your hip are easy to remember. It's simply going to be iliofemoral, ischiofemoral, pubofemoral ligaments. How's that? They go from the ischia and the ilium pubis to the femur. And what I want you to see here is look at the direction of the fibers in these around the capsule. All right, look at that. Notice it's kind of spiraling, isn't it? So what is easier? Think about your hip. Can you bring your hip up? And think about bringing your hip backwards. So flexing, you can bring your, your leg almost up to your chest. Try extending your hip. First of all, with your, with your leg extended, you cannot pull it back at all very much, right? Then if you flex your knee, then you can move it back further. Turns out your hamstrings are, are keeping you from doing that. But what happens is this. Imagine this, this hip coming up. Imagine it, you're bringing your hips up, you're flexing your hips. Easy peasy. And notice that the ligaments are just going to lax. But when you extend your hip, if you move your leg backwards, these are going to tighten. They're going to screw the head of the femur in. And it's going to prevent you from extending your leg very much. I wish I was in front of you. I can't, I'm not going to like, you know demonstrate here, but just look at this. Imagine your own hip flexing it and extending it. You can't extend it very far because those ligaments tighten 
when you flex your hip, you bring your leg up, it's no problem. There's no, no resistance here. So your ilio, your ischio, your pubofemoral ligaments are spirally oriented, and that affects your, how you can have more hip flexion than extension. Yeah, you pop it open so it has this labrum comes around. The, if you remember, if you looked inside the acetabulum, it's not actually a circle, it's kind of a C-shaped, and there's just some ligament that completes that, no big deal. And then the head of the femur, there's a ligament that comes in here. It doesn't hold it on there, it just carries some blood vessels, but there's a ligament from the head of the femur into that, uh, that soft spot in the middle, it's filled with fat and life. So this is your hip joint, deep, um, the labrum really keeps the head of the femur in there. You gotta seriously injure yourself to dislocate your hip. All right, uh, joint replacements, arthroplasty. Um, we've been doing them a long time and you can see what's gonna happen. Usually it's arthritis, but it could be congenital, it could be some other issues. But look at this, you got cartilage looking crappy, you've got osteophytes or bony growths preventing movement, causing pain. Look at this knee. And if you're over 70, it's one in four, one in three of you have got arthritis of the hip. Yep. And so um, <clears throat> the most common, you could do all the joints, you can do finger joints, they replace all the joints, uh, synovial joints. I couldn't tell you for sure all of them, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, artificial elbows. But um, most common, of course, is the knee and the hip, especially the hip. And I was amazed how long ago they were, like I used ivory back in the uh, uh, late 19th century there. And then now we use plastics and titanium and things like that, yeah. And so we got good at it and uh, very common surgery. My grandpa had both hips done. I'm sure your grandparents have hips or knees done. Um, and the future is definitely going to be the arthritic joints. Once they wear down, that's it. We can't replace that cartilage. But the future is if we could get the cartilage to repair itself, these, our joints could last longer. Osteoarthritis is a wearing down of the articular cartilage. Imagine if we could get it to, to regrow. Uh, and that's going to be the future. So if you get it, there's dozens of kinds of um, um, replacement hip joints, for instance, different kinds of material. And it, it depends how active you are and how old you are. Now, this is gonna sound crass, but if you're 90, 95, how long does that have to last, that replacement? Yeah, I, I know, I'm not even gonna say it, all right? And if you get it when you're younger, if you're in your 60s, you want it to last longer. So maybe in a very elderly patient, you wanna use uh, glue, get it in there, have a shorter recovery, and you don't have to worry about having to replace it. If you're younger, maybe do uh, something where it takes longer. They have this like porous coating. They'll even use hydroxyapatite to, to get the bone to really grow instead of just using glue. And this will last longer. And so you don't want to have to go through replacing it in 15, 20 years. And you know, just once you do a hip replacement, I mean, you've got months and months of physical therapy. And so you want to last. And so, yeah, they're working on uh, porous coatings that encourage the bone to grow into it instead of just you know, whoop, putting in some glue. I'll show you a knee. I've got hip and knee replacements. I'll bring them to lab. I collect these things. Um, yeah, and so even the patella that's worn out, we could put a little plastic on there. And uh, if you can YouTube it, a uh, video, and see it's it's pretty barbaric looking. Some of these uh, hip replacements, they got a hammer and they're just hammering this thing in there and saws cutting off the tops and yeah. But look at this, they'll, they'll just, let's say that your, your knee is all shot, right? And so they'll just cut off and square off the femur and they'll just slice off the whole plateau of your tibia, throw in the trash can, right? And, uh, and then they'll, they'll, they'll take their artificial parts. They even do 3D printing now to get you just the right um, shape. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And then, uh, yeah, they'll just uh, cement it into the existing bones and voila, you have a artificial knee, artificial hip. They work beautifully too. My grandpa had no issues, like hiking through the woods, hunting, and nothing. So um, the, the rehab is, takes a while. You gotta, cause you need to, to cut through all the, the ligaments and muscles. So you've really got to strengthen those muscles and ligaments in order to really get the benefits. But then, um, yeah, 
it's metal on plastic instead of uh, cartilage on cartilage. All right, and lastly, finally to the knee joint. And it's of interest to many of you interested in sports, Dr. Copley in lab that had uh, ACL injuries, you know, things like that. So this knee joint is, is complex and it's amazing it works. I mean, look at this thing. You have this huge femur on the top of this big tibia and you guys are, are making cuts and, and football and uh, jumping and, and, and running and stopping and to keep these bones together, it's amazing. And, just the bones themselves, it looks terrible, like it's never gonna work. But in life, you've got your quadriceps, you've got ligaments, your hamstrings, these muscles and tendons will strengthen that, um, that knee joint because the bones themselves look like they're gonna just go everywhere. So that gives you the strength there. So the bones involved would be the femur, the tibia, and your patella in front, right? The fibula, lazy, it's not even involved. Um, yeah. And I think I'll show you right in here. I'm gonna go through what I want you to know, then I'll show you some other pictures. When you look at the knee, it's gonna have a capsule all the way around it. And in front will be your, your, of course, your patella. So your quadriceps muscles, the front of your thigh attach on this, and then you'll have a uh, patellar ligament attaching to that tibial tuberosity. So that's gonna really protect the front of that knee. And it takes that muscles, the, 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 the power from the quadriceps, and, and puts it over the knee so you can extend your knee as if you're kicking it. But this capsule around there is particularly thick on the outside part because you don't want your knee moving side to side like that. And so we call those the, the medial collateral and the lateral collateral. Often called the tibial collateral and the fibular collateral. Remember your, your tibia is always medial. And one thing I want you to notice looking at this is your medial collateral is right next to that joint. It's attached to the meniscus. Your lateral is out a little bit, has some space, comes out on your, on, your, on your fibula. That'll become important in an injury in a moment. And then looking in here, you're gonna have these meniscus. Meniscus are gonna be these little circles or C-shaped fibrocartilage that kind of cushions and helps that joint. And then of course, you're gonna have the cruciate ligaments. To crucify, crucifix means cross. And so they're, they're gonna cross inside your knee to keep your your knee going forward and backwards. All right. So I said the kind of quick list, I'll do it again right here. This is a view looking down. And so the cruciates, the ACL and PCL, I'll talk about those. Um, they're named after the, where they're attached to the tibia. So the ACL is on the anterior, the front part of your tibia, and it's gonna go back. And your PCL is on the back of your tibia and it's gonna come forward. So they cross in there. It's even kind of separate. There's some fat in between them where those cruciates are. But we're gonna see that's gonna keep your knee from sliding forward or backwards. Imagine you're walking down that hill from Morgan down to DeCary. You know, your, your tip, your femur is gonna to wanna to slide forward. It'll help that. Then we look at the meniscus. Look at these things. You can see medial lateral, look, they're different. One's more of a complete circle. But uh, if you look at it from the side view, they're like this. They're thicker on the outside. So it prevents, it makes kind of a deeper socket for that femur to, to be stabilized in there. Yeah. And then the collateral ligaments, you can see the medial is all up in the medial meniscus's business. And the lateral is a little more separate from that lateral meniscus. They're not actually attached. What do you think? They're all pairs. You have a pair of cruciates, you have menisci, and collaterals. So what about your knee movements? You know you can obviously it's a hinge flex and extend. Um, when you're standing upright is there any other movement? Not really it kind of locks in position. And we can talk about how horses and cows sleep standing up it actually kind of locks yeah, but we won't. Um, but if you bend your knee you then you have some rotation a little bit of sliding forward and backwards and some rotation with a bent knee. With an extended knee standing upright, you don't have that rotation because it kind of locks in there. Yeah, I see the patella up there sliding on the top of your femur. Ah, and here's a cadaver view. So you're looking in at the front of the knee. And so if you look at the front of the knee, the ACL, anterior cruciate, is going to be front and center. Now, if I look at the back of the knee, you're going to see the posterior cruciate, and it's going to kind of disappear forward. You see a little bit of, there's here's some fat. 
beautiful. And then the meniscus, yeah, in, in real life, it feels like plastic. It's fibrocartilage, wicked, like, tough cartilage. And it's a shock absorber and it kind of makes a, a suction to keep that uh, the femoral condyles uh, in place on the, the tibial condyles on top. Beautiful. They've moved, they've cut the, look at the front, so the patella has been removed. All right, and then a particular injury uh, um, that happens quite a bit, this unhappy triad, is that if, uh, if your foot is uh, planted and then someone hits you in the outside of the knee, oh, what's going to happen is if they hit the outside of the knee, it's going to bend this way, and that medial side is going to open up. Ah. And so the unhappy, tri unhappy triad that often happens together is going to be that uh, your medial collateral, and that's going to pull because it's attached to your medial meniscus is usually going to tear, and your ACL. So ACL, medial meniscus, and medial collateral. Um, this is this a common three things that break together, although they don't necessarily have to. Um, but your foot is planted and your hit on the outside is just going to open up the inside of your knee, isn't it? Yeah. And I want you to know what the drawer test is. This really tells you what the, what the cruciates do. Cruciates, ACL, PCL, right? Um, because uh, uh, if it's broken, imagine that you're, you, you imagine you're sitting up on a table and then I were to take your knee and push it forward or backwards, in or out, it doesn't move much. But if your, um, your ACL is broken, take a look at that. Um, oh my God, you're gonna be able to uh, pull that, that, uh, that knee forward. And if the PCL is broken, you're able to push it in like a drawer, like you're opening up a drawer. So imagine you're sitting, your legs are hanging off and I could take your knee and pull it forward oh, or push it in. Right, you know your cruciate ligaments are busted because they prevent that. So walking down a hill, anything that, that is going to keep this femur and tibia, you know, keep it from sliding forward and backwards. That's what the cruciate ligaments do. The collaterals prevent this lateral motion. The cruciates prevent this front and back motion. And the menisci provide a nice little socket to to hold everything together. And then your patella in the front, your 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 quadriceps, your muscles. Uh, are going to strengthen that knee joint as well. All right, class. We're not going to get to the ankle. You guys recognize these bones? Right? Your tibia on your talus and your calcaneus. And then what are those two balls on your side of your ankle? Your medial and lateral malleolus. They come down and kind of keep that talus in the middle. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you guys learned the your favorite joints, is it the knee, is it the shoulder, depending on what sport you play, things like that. Um, but uh, we hit the big four. Um, and in lab, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, we'll have a knee joint for you to study in detail. So lifespan changes. Well, I talked about your skin changes quite a bit, your joints. I talked about before, your cartilage turns into bone. It, it, you get more, you wake up in the morning, you feel your joints, right? Uh, it's just, uh, you tell how old you are, how, the noise you make when you get up off or out of a chair, right? So as you get older, your joints start stiffening. Um, there's less blood supply to the synovial membrane. There's more bony growths. And uh, what can help against that is exercise. You know, if you, you keep active into your old age, your joints, the blood supply continues and you uh, make enough synovial fluid and uh, yeah. Um, but of course we talked about arthritis and joint replacements, so. Um, that's something that's just going to happen from wear and tear. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, um, yeah. Well, the, look at lifespan. Of course, when you're a baby, you've got fontanelles and these sutures haven't formed yet. And up through puberty, the ends of your long bones still have cartilage. So those obviously are changing your lifetime. And then going beyond that, your intervertebral discs, they, they, they're going to dehydrate and they're going to uh, uh, shortens, you're going to get shorter, more likely for them to, uh, to lose their gooey center and flexibility, uh, definitely. Um, but yeah, you keep active, it keeps your joints going well. But it's kind of the bad problem is that if you, your joints hurt, you don't want to exercise, in, even though you should exercise. So it's a, it's a tough one, but um, you guys keep up going to the gym. Don't just make it a young person thing. All right, 
And then lastly, for those interested in some, some injuries, I was talking to some people about wrist injuries. Um, the scaphoid bone uh, is this bone here, this carpal bone. It's found in your thumb side. And it can break. It can break. You fall on your wrist, it commonly can break. And what I want to put forward here is this. Now you can see you can put a screw in there to keep the bones together and they will regrow. But what's important here, I want you to talk about when I talk about bone as a living tissue, it needs a blood supply. And so the scaphoid is one where uh, if they break, there's a lot of bleeding. And then if this, the, the part of the bone that's not connected to the blood supply, if that blood supply isn't reconnected, the bones may grow together here, but this bone will die. Avascular necrosis. The bone will die without blood. And then you've got pain, you can have bacteria growing in there. It's a big problem. So on a bone like this, sometimes it will break and then one piece won't get blood anymore and that bone will die. So they need to reconnect the, the blood there. So something I wanna just put in your minds that your bones are living, growing, you know, uh, uh, organs. All right, people. So there's a lecture on joints. Um, in lab, we can practice some of these movements, make sure you understand abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, uh, uh, yeah, all these things like that. Um, all right, hope you enjoyed and uh, I'll see you guys soon.